Okay, open your Bible if you got one to Genesis chapter 1. <laughs> of course. Yeah, Genesis chapter 1. Jesus said in... Let me see if I can find it. I believe I can. You can find Genesis chapter 1. In case you don't know, Genesis is the first book. <laughs> yeah, Jesus said, uh, sure? <laughs> I will liken you unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. The rain came, the floods came, and the wind blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded on the rock. And so, the reason I guess I spend so much time in Genesis, especially the first 12 chapters, is because that's the rock, it's the solid foundation, and we've been built on a Sandy foundation is found the foundation that's built by traditions and doctrines, especially beliefs and doctrines, beliefs of men and doctrines of men. And that's the shaky foundation we've been on. So I guess so much of the stuff that I would do would be on Genesis, the first 12 chapter, because for me, I see that as the solid rock foundation of truth. And of course, it's so twisted or perverted from religion and uh, to me, that's not difficult to see. To me, so Genesis 1:26, and we can everybody can quote that passage of scripture. Verse 26 and 27 says, "Let us make man in." King James says, "In should be as, should be as our image, after our likeness." And let them, that's male and female, have dominion <coughs> over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in its image, or in his image, in or as his image, or as the image of God created he, him, male and female, created he them. Now that's a, that's a God, real common passage of scripture that most anybody can quote. Most everybody can quote. They can quote it, but they don't think of it actually. They don't think of it as uh, meaning what it says. They just quote it and uh, leave it at that place where they quote it, right? Now you're made as the image of God, then as God is, you are. But that would be a place where we would separate from that, right? So ever what God is, you are. Or ever what you are, God is. And that <laughs> it would get difficult right there, wouldn't it? Because it's it's well enough to leave God out there somewhere and us here and say that God looks like us. So then we turn around and reverse it and make God as our image. In other words, as the Lord physical, temporary image. And we know that that's not true. And I want to read something from the Cipher of Genesis by Carlos Sars. And uh, I want you to uh, I want you to just listen to this. In short, if we find what we are looking for, and uh, this is, just think about it. If we, and everybody's looking, everybody's looking for something, whether they're looking for it in a relationship or in a substance or in in, and you can just fill in any blank. Everybody is on a journey and everybody's looking for something, whatever it might be. If we find what we are looking for, it is always ourself we find. Now that's, uh, so that goes back to the mirror that we were talking about. When you really begin to see the mirror and you begin to realize uh, you're looking into the mirror at God and when you really look clearer and close, you see yourself. Because that's really what we're looking for. We're really looking for the, the self that we have been designed to be. And when I come back with this, when I find what I'm looking for, it will be me. When I come back to Genesis 1.26 and I find what I'm looking for, I find God as me. And that's, that's, that makes it different, doesn't it? But now I'm going back to building it on a solid rock foundation. So the rock foundation would be when I really see me, 
I really see God. And of course, we would say that we might kind of embrace that and hold on to that on a Sunday morning in the middle of a really good goosebump song service, or if the preacher's really preaching a really good lathered message and you're into it, then you can say, yeah, it was good for that moment. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was kind of acting like God then. At that moment, maybe, maybe. But most of the time, no, not true. See, and that's what happens. We get lost in that mirror or that reflection to realize, no, all the time. When I find really who I am, I really realize I'm God all the time and God's me all the time. When I'm low or when I'm high, from the mountain to the valley, right? From the ocean to the land. Exactly. I, I love the way that Jamie did that song. And what I do when I find that, and I, and I come back, and here's the part I want you to look at with me in this. It says in verse 26, and God. The King James says, em, said, but actually it just means to emanate. The word in Hebrew means to emanate. It means that it's like, I could say it this way, it's like it's either falling down to the earth. And I, and I, in other words, it's coming from up there or out there, wherever up there, out there is, whether it's a foot or millions of miles, doesn't matter. It's emanating or it's constantly coming forth. It's like if you get out in the sun and you uh, aren't used to being in the sun, it will blister you or tan you, right? Because it's energy that's always coming forth, right? It's always, it's because it's right now the energy of the sun is coming forth. Well, that's how that word said should have been translated should have been the emanation of energy. Now I could say it this way, I could say all is energy. As a matter of fact, we look at our physical body in its concocted form and we say that I am matter, material. But there is actually more about me that's energy than there is materiality. It's actually energy that holds this part of this thing that you call me together to call it material or matter. So there's more energy here, and God is energy. So if essence, if I really boil that down, there's more God here than there is me here. Because God is energy. Now that's a scientific fact. That might be a hard pill for us to swallow simply because of traditions and, again, dogmas and doctrines that we have been seduced to believe. And when I say we've been seduced to believe them, they were given to us, they were fed to us from our infancy. Not from ill will or from ill means, but just out of ignorance. People just didn't know. Mom and Daddy didn't know what they were saying because they had been told to say that and they were told that. Grandma and Grandpa didn't know because they were told. And you can just trace it way on, way on far back until there was a time when people wouldn't accept it. And for several hundred years, there was tremendous war over this very thing. And it was called the war of the early church movement where the truth was being suppressed by materialism and religion to make religion dominant over spiritual truth. And the sad thing <coughs> is religion won. <clears throat> so we've all been under this deception of religion for 17, 1800 years. Now, I realize that in the time that we're living right now, we are shaking loose from that and we are beginning to get <coughs> free <coughs> from this religious Dogmentation that we have all been suppressed to be under, and I wanted to, I wanted to read you some notes that I that I wrote uh, when it says, "And God said, verse twenty six, God, God." And of course, in Hebrew, we know that God would be Elohim, Ali, and uh, <coughs> Lamed. Hey, Bob, and Mim. That, uh, that's 
this word God in Hebrew, spelling from right to left. Excuse me. Okay. That's, that's God in Hebrew. Now, if I break this glyph down, now that's not a personal name. I, I would say that this could be called a formula of energy and, and power, etc. Because if you just take these first glyphs like this, Alif Lamit, that is called El in Hebrew. But it's also translated for the word God. But it's also, if I were to, uh, <clears throat> if I were to, well, I'll just leave it at that. I'll get to it a little later. El, Alif Lami. That means power. Power is love in motion. We get really confused over power and force. And many times we will use the term force to describe power. And that's, that's a misuse of the term. As a matter of fact, probably the best book that I have ever read to try to make it clearer in this is Power Versus Force by Dr. Hawkins. That's a phenomenal book. Wayne Dyer really promoted that book for a long time. Dr. Hawkins uh, was a psychiatrist, psychologist, and had one of the largest psychological firms in the city of New York for years and years. I mean, he had something like 50, 60 psychiatrists that worked for him, and he left that kind of success to promote spiritual truth. He, became, he actually began to travel in the later years of his life. He was in his late 60s, and he walked away from that kind of success because he saw the need for spiritual, not religion. He doesn't teach religion. It's not into Baptistism or Church of Godism or Charismania or any of the religious dogmas that, that we have all been infected by. He began to speak and teach spiritual truth. And so he really leaned heavily in the chiropractic field because many of the, the doctors, the chiropractic doctors, begin to see the spiritual truth, and they still do today. And uh, we have one here in Dalton, Dan, who actually took over the shop where Pam used to work, the nutritional shop. And he, he's a phenomenal chiropractor, but he's on spiritual truth. And so what he does is he works with the body to get the body back in tune to its true nature, which is energy, power. That's who we are. And if I were to say that's who God is, you would not doubt it one bit. But if I said that's who you are, you would say, uh-uh. Because you know, you know what you think of as your downs, your low moments, your weak moments. You don't think very much of your high moments, are you? <laughs> you know, the time when you feel all powerful. El, I need for me. That's also God, but that's also energy. That's also power. And its motivation is love. And so, when we begin to break this glyph down and we begin to look at it, the Alif, the Alif is number one. Let me just do it real quickly right over here on this side of the board. Alif is number one, and it's the number one to symbolize that God is number one. It's hard to describe that. And so the Ali is the, re the reference to all that is. So in the ancient Hebrew, it actually is the source. So what the source of the what? The source of everything. So Ali represents the source, and that's why it comes up and it's used as the em, as the number one. And it emanates out of a phrase in Hebrew that's called in, A-I-N, which means nothing. So that nothing is everything. So that when you look out, and I say this a lot, especially in that series I did on the glorious darkness, you look out at night into what you would call the black sky, that's the in. And you say, well, it's black. It's nothing. I know it. It's everything. It, it is that which holds those little white dots that you and I call stars, planets, galaxies, and solar systems, it's that which holds them all in place. So they, they ain't even there if it wasn't for that. So that is God. That's number one. And the in, A-I-N, in, in Hebrew, was the reference to that. And so the way you do it is just by drawing a circle. That, that, was, that was how they, everything, the alphabet, everything, languages, everything, it, it, it evolved or it came out of, it emanated 
That word got translated said ten times. Ten times. So in Hebrew, you have this right here. And you've seen this a lot. You've seen me do this quite a bit because this is the same thing as this. Okay. Of course, this is, of course, this is the stick man. Everything, everything is built on stick man theology because in <coughs> Sabbath, in Sabbath, is, is ten. You see me do that. One, one plus two equals three, and uh, two plus or three. So uh, <coughs> I'll start out. One plus two equals three. Uh, three plus three equals six, and six plus four equals ten. That becomes the key number four, and four or uh, ten plus. 5 equals 15, <coughs> and then 15 plus 6 equals 21, and then 21 plus 7 equals 28. 2 plus 7, 2 plus 8 equals 10, <coughs> which equals 1. So this number and this number, seven and four, are, are very key numbers because in four and in seven is ten or one. You got what you follow what I'm saying? In four is ten. So if I know how to do gematria, I can take four and back it up and realize it's actually referring to number one. So you have to get this. I'm praying that you can get this. Four is the number for the earth. The earth is the physical visible manifestation of all that God is, Elohim. It's the outward expression. It's the emanation. It's the, again, I'm coming back to, it's falling down. It's coming down. That word got translated said. Okay? Here's the ten says. That's used ten times in Genesis 1. Ten, one, two, three, four, five. That's called the tree of life in Kabbalah. And in this tree of life, you have the three emanations of God. You can call it Father, Mother, Son, you can call it Father, Holy Spirit, Son. You can call it Light, Life, and Love. It's just a lot of different things that you can call it because it's three in one. It's out of the one comes the three. And then from here you have the seven, which is this. Same thing, same, exactly the same thing, and meaning the same exact thing. So that's Elohim. That's this glyph right here. Then we come to the Lamid. And this is a powerful glyph, the Lamid, and this is number 30. So it takes the three aspects and brings them into duality. And so when you realize that, it actually is talking about, and I pray that you can grasp this, I, I, you know, numbers, numerology, numbers, it, 30, it brings this aspect into understanding and knowing. And here's how it gets that. In Hebrew, in the middle of the tree of life, is that. It's a window. It's a door. It's in every one of you. That window and that door is right here in the core of your being, i.e. in your heart. And it's called understanding. It's called knowledge. In the New Testament, Jesus said it this way in John 7, you shall know. The word know is gnosko, where they got gnosis or Gnostic, and it was the Gnostic church and the Gnostic movement that lasted, actually lasted for seven or eight hundred years. But it was the first 200, 200 to 300 years that Gnosticism was thought by what evolved out of it as literalism or Orthodox Christianity. Orthodox Christianity was finally organized in 326 at the Nicene Council, and at that time it handcuffed and imprisoned Gnosticism. 
so that you no longer will go to the core of your being, the heart, the window, the access place that you have to get to know God or to get in contact with God. Now you have to come to church, you have to come to the priest. We have exalted the priest craft above God. Happened to all of us. And so I'm not blaming my mom. I'm not blaming my grandma and my great grandma mom. <laughs> it, it's been done to us. It's been done to all of us. So here we are. We're at this place and we're waking up. There is an awakening, folks. It's not necessarily in the religious community. It's an awakening that's happening all in all relationships. I mean, there's so many good things that I saw. I saw a group of men, Denzel Washington, and uh, what's the big guy with the, the big smile, the uh, Dumb and Dumber? Uh, Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey. It's just quite a few guys telling about how they don't go to religion, but they go to this place right here. They, ah, they go to the core of their being. They go to that place that is the window. It's the door. It's the access place that all of us have. And it's that access where we can talk to Ali, God. We can be in touch. We can have communication. It, mostly it's through meditation or through being quiet, through finding the disciplines and that's where we're going back to. We have to come back. The disciplines that you implement in your living, those are the things that will, that will, and this is the la me. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the la me. The heart, the window, the door, the access place that you have to knowledge, to know, to know, and that knowing comes from the core of your being. In other words, your heart. And it's from there that we have the third grip, which is the Hebrew hay. The hay. <clears throat> you say, if I leave the cow off of them, they get dry. <clears throat> and the hay is number five. And the hay always represents reproductivity, or number five, the feminine aspect of our being. We can call it, in, out of Genesis 2, we can call it the Esha, or the feminine womb, W-O-M-B, of fire. It's the creative ability that we all have. So we have the hay, which gives us, and also because it's feminine, it goes into emotional energy. So it has a whole lot to do with lunar. You have solar, lunar, and earth. So you have those three aspects. Solar is the sun, it's God. The moon is lunar, it's your soul, it's your connection, feminine, emotional. The moon's emotional. You understand what I'm saying? It, it affects the ocean, it affects you. If it affects all that masses, amounts of water, you're a water vessel. It affects you. It affects all of us. Okay, <laughs> right? Right? So the feminine is the emotional. That's not a bad thing. Because every one of us are. If we can flow and learn to flow with our emotions in a, I've used this term, good way, in a good sense, does it not always lift you up and pick you down? I mean, pick you up, knock you down. It does knock you down if you go in the negative sense. Have you ever notice how easy it is to go with the negative sense and get stuck there? I feel so bad. And boom, you get, you, you're there you are. You don't have to be there. You can change it any place that you like. So it's very emotional. Okay, and then we come to the third, or fourth glyph, which is the smallest glyph in the Hebrew alphabet. It's called the Yud or the Yod. And here we go, look at it. It's number 10. And wow, it deals with divinity in duality. It has to do with the male symbol, the phallic, and it has to do with the female symbol, uh, symbol the yoni. So, and you combine the two, and again, it's dealing with it up here in your brain, the male and the female. Creative aspect takes the two, takes the male and the female aspect of your brain to be the yod, or the yod, to creativity, the combining of the two. And then, watch this, the final glyph is the mem, this is the mem final, and this is, you know, I'm just doing this, this is the spelling, it's the mem final, and it is 
number 600, and it's taking the number for man. The number for man generally we male is we use the number six, use the number five for female, use the number six for male, but now we've taken with three digits, 600, now we've taken it back to the water that has the cosmic ability, or in other words, it's divine or it's spiritual creativity. Water is always creativity. Anywhere you look, when you're looking for water or looking at water, it always refers to creativity. It's always talking about the, uh, the harmonious ability to create. Now, within... Within the physical body, there are two main functions, and I want you to hear these with me. There are two main functions. This is something I wrote several weeks back. And these two main functions have been, have been grossly misunderstood from Genesis chapter 2. These two main functions are the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. Now, that's two functions. But they, both of these functions functions as one. They function together. They are molded together. They are, they are, one doesn't work without the other. In other words, the tree of life is your heart that pumps the blood throughout your physical body. The tree of knowledge is your brain and your neurological system. And that's why we have now such a resurgence of uh, neurologists that are now psychologists, psychiatrists. I mean, you know, that field of medicine was not even recognized 100 to 150 years ago. It was not even noted by the, phys the, the uh, physical community. And when they began to say things about neurology and also uh, the uh, uh, bone crushers, now their name is slip my mind. Chiropractors. <laughs> of course the medical field, because the medical field wanted to, they wanted to indoctrinate us to say that we're the only true science of medicine and we're going to give you some pills and manage your problems. And they've done that very well in deception. So they have, they've got us. They've got us, they've got us uh, under their power. Anyway, the physical body that's, I mean, that's what the, uh, that's a lot of what the po the political game is about now. It's about the control of you and me. I mean, trace it back to what, what is it? Medicine is like a couple that I, they're on my monthly mailing list, and because of something that happened a couple, three years ago under Obamacare, now then a person who has neurological issues, doesn't matter what it is, whether they were born with some kind of a neurological issue, you know, uh, we can call it brain damage or different things like that, and now that they're in physical bodies that are 50 years old and strong, but yet they have they have some problems, real serious problems. Like this one couple I know, they have a son that's trying to get some help from the government to put him in a to put him in a place where he could get adequate help because when you get to be 50 year old, you're in a full grown body. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. That thing does, does it. Uh, so when you get to be 50 year old and your physical body that's strong, but your mind's not working exactly the way it needs to work, you could be a real hindrance to your mom and dad, even though they love you and they try to take care of you. And so they need help. I, this couple needs desperate help. Well, they went to try to get their son put in a facility where he could be cared for where he can have the proper kind of care. They can't do that. They're, they don't have the, the means, the ability. Under Obamacare, they passed a law, slunk something through, and said that no longer will the Medicare or Medicaid assist someone in, in a home or a facility that, that of a person that has neurological issues. Could they be dementia, Alzheimer's, or physically? The government don't pay. And so what happens to people like myself or like this couple right here, they don't have $5,000 a month to pay to put the person in that facility. <coughs> what do they do? Because there's some neurological issues. Well, now we have neurologists that are really beginning, and uh, chiropractors and other medical 
fields and people who are getting involved, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So that people can get assistance, just like this couple that I know. They need help because they, they can't. Do uh... you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. The, yes. the bill is too, it's too huge. I'm, I'm, my dad is 81. You fix him. Yeah, you have the same situation. He, he is trapped staying home with mom, and he's yep. able to get about same 12 situation. hours a week's worth of help. So what you have is you have like this couple. The caregivers oh, yeah. now are the ones that's taking the uh, the load of that. And uh, But anyway. Uh, within the physical body, there are two main functions of that. That is the functions of life and mobility. The human body, number one, is the heart and circular system, which is the natural, the material apparatus that you see as a physical body. Uh, pushes and pulls this miraculous substance we call blood. And if I spell blood in Hebrew, I want you to just see how blood is spelled. Blood is spelled with Dalit Mim. This is number four, and this is 600. This equals blood. <clears throat> and if I put an Alif in front of this, same exact glyph, just like I did right here, this spells Adam. In other words, Adam is blood with an Alif on it. In other words, it's blood <coughs> with God attached to it. So who is Adam? Adam is blood man, God man. It's the same thing. So if I'm saying Adam, I'm talking about God man. I'm talking about God as man. Not God in man's image, even though God is in man in its blood. Okay, I mean, that's not hard, is it? And how does he do that? He does that through ruach, breath. Because you take the air you breathe, and I eat the oxygen, the air that you take in through your mouth, your nose, into your lungs, where does it go? It goes directly into your bloodstream. And you got to have that. So the combination of these things, and once we, as we, as we begin to see all of these things and how that they are all combined and how they all come together, then it just, it's just phenomenal. And then... Uh, okay. uh, then you have the nerve system. I mean, that's, that's the blood system. Then you have the nerve system. The nerve system, which is the brain, the entire nervous system. In other words, it's the tree of the knowledge of right and left. It's the brain, the abrum or cerebrum, the cerebrum, and the cerebellum, the lower brain. You have that whole apparatus up here in the skull, the hill of Golgotha, right here in the hill of Golgotha. This is where it's slain. This is where the two become one. This is where the thieves on each side are merged together. It's right here, you know. And you see all of these phenomenal stories in Scripture, stories that were known hundreds, thousands of years as myths. Today we are so corrupted with what the idea of a myth was. We think a myth is something that's false and not true. And it just it just dawned on my slow lightning fast mind here just a month or two ago that I used the word myth a lot and most people associate a myth with a false story. And when I'm saying myth in my ideology, a myth is a fabulous story, not false, but true that has energy to ignite the God, the Alif that's already in you to stir you up on your divine self. And so, you know, things, I say things like that and I think, wow, no wonder people misunderstood me because of their paradigm that they thought from and I'm not thinking from that paradigm no more. I moved away from that 25 years ago and I'm just, I've got to come back and I've got to think with my terminology so that I can reach the people that I want to reach, which is everybody, <laughs> Baptist and all, it doesn't matter to me, everybody, so that I can reach them and realize, tell them, really I'm talking about the fabulous stories in the Bible, not as a history, but as an energy, as an emotion, as something that can stir you and really get you to moving from the, the real Alif person that you are, God man, God woman, right? Amen. <laughs> 
So the nerve system, which is your brain, the entire nerve system, which is the tree of the knowledge of right and left, the tree of the knowledge of right and left, I don't like to say good and evil because it totally throws us off track. If I say raw and told, then I can look in Hebrew and say, oh, raw and told, right and left. Yes, male and female is a better way to say that. Ash and asha, and that's the fire and the womb of fire. It's that that begins to ignite a thought, incubates a thought. As it incubates a thought, guess what it does? It'll give life to it. It'll produce it. If it doesn't incubate the thought, then the thought will pass on through because you can't even remember what you had for supper last Friday. Can you? Anybody? Hmm. I mean, it ain't been long ago. Why? Because it just went through. You don't remember it. I know you did it to my own, but God, it was, it was good. Then, wasn't it wasn't. Well, because that's where you were. But it wasn't something that you really meditated on. It wasn't something that you really got. So let me read something else to you from Carlos Sars. This is, this is phenomenal. It says, Alif cannot be known Alif cannot be known but it can be witnessed. Now that's the catcher right there. Isn't that what they said about the Tao? The Tao, the Tao that can be. Where do you think that comes from? It's not the Tao. That they're saying the same thing. Oh, absolutely. Exactly the same. I mean, yeah, it's like who, which is the oldest Hindu, Zoroaster, or Hebrew? Well, I think there's not any question right now. The only question right now would be Zoroaster or Hindu. Are these the oldest religions? Where did they come from? The Vedic. You know, how we can go back. We can go back historically probably five or six thousand years with the Vedic. Huh? Yeah, All right. and also Zoroaster. So there you go. Hindu is just a relatively new idea. Of course, we've gotten way, way off the base of what it truly means and what it was for. You take the real Indians, the ones from the nation of India, those who, like Deepak Chopra, they're as God-loving and God-fearing as you and me. I don't care if you are a devout Baptist. They love their family. They love God as much as you do. And they're not wicked and they're not corrupt. No matter what media tries to say to you and me, we get so commercialized, so deceived by this, this thing called media, this news thing on TV. Hmm. I leave cannot be known, but it can be witnessed. I want you to get that. How do you witness Ali? Right there. You witness it through the door of your heart where you will take the time to meditate, to ponder, to open your mind. And that's hard to do because our mind gets closed down by dogmatic religion, by doctrines. People can quote you all kinds of beliefs by telling you, well, I believe this and I believe that. But what do you know? I don't know. <laughs> Forget what you believe. Forget the idea that you're blocked in. And okay, so you like your belief. That's fine. What do you know? What is it that resonates from the core of your heart? Let's get to that because that's where the witnesser is at. The witnesser is inside you. It's the one watching all of the other things. So he says, listen to it. Olive cannot be known, but it can be witnessed. We observe it in the fact that thought cannot think of a duration which never ends. In the fact that our everyday thought is established on a duality. And in the fact also that the further we investigate our own minds, the deeper is the mystery of existence as such. That's why I asked you, man, do you remember what you had? No. You know why? The witnesser wasn't paying any attention to it. If the witnesser was paying attention to it, you would know it. You'd remember it. Ultimately, we come to realize that consciousness is a discontinuous phenomenon. Consciousness is God, right? God is conscious. God is consciousness. Kabbalah is a training of the mind that makes it so subtle and pliable as to allow it to pass through the mysterious doorway of the human genesis 
Here we go. I'm talking about the day on this, this doorway and enter into the sphere of life death. In other words, it comes through this unknown window door inside your being into this time dimension. Timelessness entered in time through you. And, and in other words, you're not going to die, but you are going to lay down your physical body because you are eternal as God is eternal. Because God just took on the suit that you call your physical body as a temporary suit to wear as a garment or a covering to experience the hot and the cold, the dimensions of this world. And he, did, he does it and He did it in you and in me. Now, how did we get, how did we get so far off the base from where we are? How did, how did we get to where we are today from where we were 1,800 years ago? When you go back and you read, if you go back and you read the lost books of the Bible, you will read and you will recognize they were not talking about a history. They were talking about a mystery. And that mystery was God that they were learning to witness that cannot be known was living through them in phenomenal ways. In phen I'm talking about phenomenal ways because when God begins to do that, as God begins to do that, it moves you and me into a dimension we call the supernatural. Do you understand what I'm saying? Into a dimension beyond time and space. And when we get into that place, can we walk through a wall? Well, most likely we can. It's just like if you will watch the shadow of a bird as it goes across the field when it hits the trees, it just goes through the trees and right on through. Well, if you and me are just the shadow of the resemblance, that would be nothing because we could do that. We could do that. How? Just like they did in the early church. They did think. I mean, come on. I, I mean, there are some very mysterious things even in the book of Acts, even though it's so twisted and messed up. There's some things there that you read about and, you know, you want to have, what was it they call it, the Philip transportation system? <laughs> hmm? Is that Was that just something that was available to Philip or was that something that the Gnostics understood and knew? Because even today, the Vedic Hindu still practices. Yeah, they still they can still they can transport themselves instantly from here to there. So, oh, that's that's crazy. Well, I realize that it's crazy to the limited natural mind, but it's not it's not crazy to a divine mind. So, which one do we want to pay attention to? The divine mind is open inside you all of the time, saying, "Come unto me. Come unto me. Think." Through me, think my thoughts. Those thoughts that you come into the dayat, the doorway of knowledge, the tree of knowledge, the tree of gnosis, that is a doorway of infinite possibilities. Not impossibilities, because remember, with God, what? Oh, all things. Oh, really? Is that just some, some special thing God said to somebody years ago? But it doesn't, it's no longer apply today. You know, it's so, it's so strange to me that God could do all of this stuff in the Old Testament can't do nothing in the New Testament. Now, it's so strange to me that God quit doing anything, quit talking, <laughs> quit moving, quit doing anything. Die, you know, died out. I think, of, I think Catholicism said, well, when the last apostle died, then it all it died with, it, with him or her or whatever. It's really sad to think that way, isn't it? So how did we get so far away? Well, we did it by dogma and we did it by tradition and by religion. But I want to read you something here by Alvin Boyd Kuhn. And of course, you know, Alvin Boyd Kuhn and Carlos Sars are undoubtedly two of my favorite authors. Let me just read you something here that Alvin Boyd Kuhn wrote. This was his last book. He wrote this book in his 80s called The Rebirth of Christianity. And it was written in, I think, 1962, I believe, or 64, somewhere, somewhere along in there. Phenomenal, phenomenal book called The Rebirth for Christianity. Mm -hmm. And what he's talking about is he wants, and here he's quoting, this is, this is Alan Boyd Coon, Rebirth for Christianity. He's quoting from Godfrey Higgins. Godfrey Higgins wrote this, his, his work, Anacalypse, I have that book. But what, what Coon says from a quote of Godfrey Higgins in the Anacalypse says that what we call early histories are not histories of men, 
but are contrivances under the appearance of history to perpetuate doctrines in a manner understood only by those who had a key to the enigma. I know that's maybe difficult or maybe a little different. Only to those who had an understanding. The understanding actually comes by the open door of your heart where you will meditate and you will begin to think on the histories to realize they're truly mysteries. If I'm thinking about the story of Moses and I'm not looking at it as a historical event but something that and something that happened thousands of years ago, but I'm looking at it as an enigma, a mystery, then eventually through the day off, the keys will come to me how to unlock the mystery of that story. And when I begin to see the keys come to me, I will realize that I am a Moshe drawn up out of water. I am God drawn up out of a material substance. That's what the story is about. Yeah. It's not about a man that was living thousands of years ago and walking through a reed sea. It's about you learning how to cross the perimeter of your heart and make the two one. But even the make, fact of his life was three sections of 40. Body, soul, spirit. And the story tells him 40, 40, 40. Uh, and that's where I'm going I mean, that's because, again, this is a continuation from last Sunday. It's all about spirit, soul, and body. It's all about that. And how did we get so far away from that? But, hey, we're coming back to it. We are, we're waking up. Glory to God, we're waking up. So, he said, if you have the key, wow, this is what we offer. We offer that for people who will exercise a discipline. And I guarantee you, you have to exercise the discipline to be in the presence of this energy, even though you can get it, like Carl said, on a CD, if you really get into it. But we offer it here free of charge. Isn't yeah, that wonderful? <laughs> Hallelujah. So, now let me read you something else he says right here. The entire body of Scripture, this is Kuhn, the entire body of Scripture must now be transfigured in our consciousness with the light which it was designed first to conceal, i.e. told as a historical story, not true, but it's just telling a story. It, it, was, it was designed first to conceal, then reveal. And what did we do? We got completely away from the rev revealing of it. We got away from the revelation of it. We got away from that which was concealed and made it into a literal history. He said, the task now confronting modern intelligence is to throw off the blinders of a shallow realism that have obscured mystical vision and to awaken the long stifled faculties of insight into nominal verities. Wow. Mm -mm. I love the way he writes. I will inaugurate finally a re-enlightenment and transfiguration of the human society. In ancient times, the principle of a lofty soul science were the substance, the nub, the core of the mysteries. And where did it go? Well, we can say that what happened to it was about 1800 or so years ago, it got shuffled under the table and it was told to you and me, you can't read it, you can't understand it. And the truth of the matter is, you didn't even have to read. You just had to hear the story and the energy in the story resonated with the energy in God. In other words, the God being concealed was there to be revealed. And they said, no, you can't get it that way no more. You've got to come down here to the priest craft and we will tell you what it said. So I want to take you to a place where I think that we got so far off base in your Bible, you can see this with me, you can look at this with me, and you can make your own conclusions. And, I, and that's, this, is, this is something we're going to work with for a, for a pretty good while. So go with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 32. A passage of Scripture that all of you all know Genesis chapter 32. And I want to talk to you about this 
particular character or this particular glyph. <coughs> I'll just put it up here on the board so that you can see this, this character or this glyph because I'm going to uh, I'm going to use this a lot here. Now, you found the story, and again, I, you found it. You didn't know what I was talking about. You go here and you find this story, and let's read it. And uh, verse 24, Genesis 32, verse 24 let me give you a synopsis. Let me give you an overall picture. And I know here you probably have heard this from me a number of times. An overall picture of Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12. An overall picture of that is Genesis 1, 2, 3 is a picture or a diagram or a blueprint or a schematic of building the physical body. God's design to build a physical body. That's what Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is about. It's the seven yawns. The seven facets of energy locked into material, materiality. That's, it got translated days, but the word yawn in Hebrew, matter of fact, I'm going to coin me a new term, yawnology. And so that's what stickman theology is. Stickman theology is actually yawnology. Yawn is the Hebrew word and actually the word has a very, very rich, broad meaning other than what we recognize as day. So if I look at yom as just day, where does it include night? Or is night, the 12 hours of night, excluded from the first chapter of Genesis? Or is it just about the 12 hours of, quote, day? And of course you realize, you see the fallacy of that because it's there. But... Yomology, that's my new, that's a new word I'm coining, yomology. Now, Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, the first three is the diagram of the physical body, and then Genesis chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 is how that, that, that yomology works and functions in a tripart being spirit, soul, and body, i.e. human. That's why that you find the story of three boys repeated over and over and over three times. So you have the stories of, of what we call Adam and Eve, Cain, Seth, and Abel. Then we have three boys of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Jacob. And then we have a story of three more boys, Tara's three boys, and the key of the story is Abraham. That's where you start picking him up in chapter 12. He's mentioned in the end of chapter 11 as one of the three boys. But then the story picks up in chapter 12 and it talks completely about him. Now let me tell you this. Something, well, let me just read it to you. Verse 24, I'll show you something right here. In Genesis chapter 32, verse 24, it says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man. Now, how many of you have always been told that he wrestled with an angel or that he wrestled with God? Yes, that's what he's told. But what does it say in your Bible? Who's he, who's he wrestling with? What does it say? I mean, don't, yeah, don't be afraid of it. What does it say? Who's he wrestling with? A man. a man. This word man is used from Genesis chapter 19, I believe. Let me just look real quick. Genesis, <coughs> Genesis chapter 19 in verse 8, talking about the story of Sodom. This word man in Hebrew is actually the word esh, which is first used in Genesis chapter 2 and it's also used for the word man because God took out of Esh to create Esha. You were told that God took out of Adam. It doesn't say that. In Hebrew it says God took out of Esh and made 
Esha. Esh is translated man. Esha is translated womb man. And you were told that's Adam and Eve, and it ain't. It's the male and female. It's the spirit and the soul. It's the part of you in the, in the area of your gnosis, <coughs> your knowledge. It's a part that we have been pushed aside and we forgot. We don't know nothing about it. So that word for Adam, the Hebrew word alif dalit mim, is no longer used from Genesis 19 for the word man through the rest of the whole book of Genesis. It's always the word esh. Translated, man. But now who is this man called esh? Actually, it means man of fire. Because the way you spell it, esh, is you spell it alif shin. Hey, alif shin hey. And so actually it's referring to God who's materialized in the physical world as fire. Just like it tells you in Hebrews chapter, chapter 13, I believe, God is a consuming fire. Psalms, I think Psalms 48, God is the sun, S-U-N, fire, energy, energy. It's, I say this, I said it to start with, I'll say it one more time here at the close, that you are more energy than you are matter. And there are some to the tune of 70 or 700 trillion atoms that make up your physical body. That, that, that part of, that's a hell of a lot. <laughs> that's a bunch. You know what I'm saying? That's more than there are people on the face of the earth by, God, by gazillion times. Right? Yeah, you know, we're talking... We're talking a whole slew of zeros. That's, and there's more energy than they are those cells because it's the energy that calls them cells in their separate places to create the organs, to create the physical body and hold the physical body to be what it is. It's energy does that. That's God. Wow! <laughs> if you can think about it, that's what's holding all of you together. Yourself. It's God. You're living, breathing, Moving. God. And, and there he says, and Jacob, that's the man of the flesh, the deceiver, the trickery, that's the one you look at in the mirror and think it's really you. If you could see the fireman you are, if you could see the ash you are, and you wouldn't even think about wrestling with him. And, now, and here again, this word wrestle is not the word that's translated for wrestle anywhere else. If you see where David's going to go wrestle with Goliath or you see where somebody else is going to go wrestle, it's, totally, it's a totally a different word. This word right here in Hebrew is abak. And actually, the word means like a vapor to float away. And the word vapor or float away means particles of light. So what is he doing? This Yaakov is wrestling with the particles of light. I mean, get the revelation of it. Who, who is he wrestling with? He's wrestling with the energy of himself. In other words, God. The very thing that's got him held together. And guess who wins? He walks away differently. He walks away transformed. He walks away saved. He experienced salvation. Why? He wrestled with himself. He got in here. He got into the core. And notice what it says right here. Let's just read it all. It says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled with him. That word wrestle, abach. It just actually means vapor of light. Light particles. Vapors of light. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with a man. With this, this fire man. This fire until the break of day, when he saw that it prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint, and he wrestled with him, and he said, let me go, for the day breaks, and he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said unto him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said unto him, your name will no more be called Jacob, but Israel. Now who told him his name's not going to be Jacob, but Israel? The man. Esh did. He did. Esh did. Fire man. The fire man that's in Genesis chapter 2 that from him was made the Esha, the fire of womb. 
that we call Adam and Eve by gross misunderstanding of the story. And he said, you'll not know, your name will not no longer be called. Now what are we talking about, a name or a nation? Get that. What are we talking about, the name or a nation? And here's where we really begin to split from traditional religion and its historicity. It's never been a nation. It's always been a name. Never been a nation. Always been a name. And what is the name? Is right here. Israel. Israel. And if we grasp Israel, do you know who Israel is? Israel is you manifest spirit, soul, and body. Three part being in one visible location. And that's who you are. And Israel has always been that. And guess what happened? Guess what happened? Out of this phenomenal teaching got off into literal historical teaching the same thing that Christianity did to it as its counterpart and began to call Israel a nation of people and said they were God special. When it always was referring to you and me, the Israel of God, who is special, who is chosen, and who is God's people. But it was all peoples of the whole earth who are the Israel of God. Just like the story tells you. Okay, so we'll, we're just going to unhook right there and just pick up from here next week because... Uh, there's just so much to squeeze out of it, of the spirit, the soul, and the body. So in essence, the story right there, he went off to be alone and be quiet mm -hmm. and dealt with himself to tell himself who he really was. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the story of us? Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> Isn't that what you've been teaching for so many years? Learn to be still. Learn to be still. Yes, what happens when you do that? Let me show you what happens because it's all in this story. When you really learn to get still and you learn to get quiet and you learn to close off this right here, this is the dual nature, these two eyes. You learn to close these dual natured eyes off that sees duality. Not right or wrong, but it sees duality. You learn to close these off and you learn to see right through here. And you know what you call the name of that place where he saw this light show, this vapor? You call it pineal, the pineal gland. And that's exactly what he called it. He said, that I will name this place. And what did he name? Mm -hmm. He named the place. And that's what happens when you learn to get quiet right here in this day off moment. You learn to shut down all of the duality, the dual hearing, the duality of seeing. And you get quiet and you center up, you focus in mm -hmm. on your pineal gland opens. And you know, now we're beginning to realize that through the, the soda drinks and the waters and contaminated waters that we get is calcifying our pineal gland. And our pineal gland is a very, very vital part of our well-being. It's so not only is it the eye of God, but it, it's like a pharmacy. It's like a pharmacy that's inside us. And it gives us the things that we need, you know. It, supplies but if it's it's calcified <laughs> so it's not working the way and they say well you get older that your pineal gland calcifies and gets hard well my terminology of that is bull hockey that ain't true because as you get older it should get clearer you should be able to see with greater focus you should begin to lose a lot of the distractions why it's not because you're older it's because you've learned the disciplines you can do this and be 22, 24, and be a giant. You, don't have, you do not have to wait until you're as 